I better quit while I'm ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank okay. you. With that out of the way, um, we are ready to go. Attorney Fiore. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I am Kristen Fiore here today on behalf of Cindy Stewart, the clerk and comptroller for Hillsborough County. I already reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Um, the refund ordered in this case was void for multiple reasons. First, Section 943.0585 does not authorize a petitioner under the statute to seek relief or a court to order such relief in the form of a return of any financial obligation paid in the underlying criminal proceedings. If the legislature had intended to include this in the statute remedies such as a refund, it could have and would have done so in the plain text of the statute. Well, Ms. Fiore, yes. doesn't, doesn't Nelson make pretty clear that um, she would have had a due process right to a refund at that point? And if so, what mechanism is there for her to exercise that right? So, Your Honor, um, <clears throat> Nelson versus Colorado does say that under the statute at issue in that case, the Colorado statute regarding refunds in the event of an acquittal on appeal uh, it, or a vacation of a, of a conviction on appeal, that that particular statute violated the defendant's uh, due process rights because that was their property, the refund. And the statute uh, put, put an onerous burden on those defendants that had had their convictions vacated to, they had to prove their innocence by clear and convincing evidence to obtain their refund. And the state said that they shouldn't give the refund back. This case is different because the clerk here is not saying or taking the position that the defendant is not entitled to a refund. That's, no, that, not... that's fine. That's fine. I'm asking by what mechanism then could she have gotten one? I mean, nobody, neither party mentions chapter 961. Is it your position that she should have filed an application under 961? I and mean, should she have applied for a refund under chapter 28? I mean, it's, it's, you know, you say she's entitled to you. You acknowledge she's entitled to a refund. So, and then what? <laughs> yeah. So there is a procedure, and we we did refer in our briefs to other procedures. We were not specific, but if the court will allow me, there is a procedure in nine thirty eight point oh six for refunds in Florida statute nine thirty nine thirty nine point oh six. And that says that a defendant who is acquitted is not liable for costs. And there is a procedure that the defendant must go through. And that money and request is through a separate commission that has nothing to do with the clerk's office. So we did not have the opportunity as the clerk to participate in the underlying proceedings, at which time that could have been, um, you know, ferreted out of how this process would work for the client, uh, the excuse me, the defendant to get a refund. In this case, the problem is, as we've explained in our briefs, the clerk does not, it's not an issue as um, Apelli argues that the clerk is crying poor or, you know, find playing finders keepers with defendant's money. Quite the contrary, the clerk does not have custody of the funds that were paid because by statutory design, the clerk, clerk does not have the discretion to retrieve those funds and does not have the authority or the jurisdiction to, I'm, I'm sorry, did not have the discretion to retain the funds and does not have the authority to retrieve them. And so if the clerk is mandated in these cases to refund the money, it will necessarily have to expend significant resources to figure out how to structure this within the confines of its statutory duties. Because as you know, the clerk is a constitutional officer in section 28.353A. It sets forth the clerk's duties regarding its court-related um, functions, okay? And 
nowhere I in think, here. I think what your friend, I think what your friend on the other side would say is, so what? I mean, you, if if the Constitution requires um, that that this defendant be reimbursed for criminal costs uh, that they that were imposed, um, the fact that you're telling us well, this would be really onerous and hard and tough and expensive and time consuming for the, for the clerk. I think the answer is, well, you know, sometimes the government has to, has to bear um, expense to vindicate people's rights. I think that would be your friend's, your friend's argument. Yeah, and I, I and you know, is that, is there a different, is there a different tack or is there a different argument you can make as to why the clerk cannot, in other words, the, the clerk is not a, like a bank that is keeping accounts Correct. for individuals. It's, it's not a custodian of people's money. Correct. It, at, least, at, least in the criminal, at least in the criminal system. Correct. It is not a custodian of people's money. And so what happens is, is when the, when the money comes in, okay, for someone pays a fine, for example, that money, there's a pro statutory process cited in the briefs in which the clerk maintains 10%, and this is all the statute, maintains 10% of that money, okay, in order to pay for the court-related functions that are set forth in 28.353A. And 3B says they cannot use that money for anything other than what is set forth in that statute. And so what happens is the rest of the money is then remitted without getting into the details to the Department of Revenue, to the state, to be distributed to different funds for, for pur other purposes. And so what happens is, is this, this is not harmless to the clerk because, uh, you know, forgive the saying, but it would be robbing Peter to pay Paul if the clerk had to give this, these was ordered to give this money back without statutory authority because it would be taking the money from other pockets, other uh, pockets of money that the clerk has and subjecting the clerk herself possibly to liability for misappropriating funds, for example. Or so this is, there is a reason, you know, that the statute does not provide this for this. It's not on the form in the criminal rules for a refund of these, these monies. The only mention is that the clerk cannot charge a, um, fee for the filing of the petition, which it does not. And so the, the problem is here, again, the clerk is not taking the position that the uh, def these defendants are not entitled to this money. The clerk is taking the position that the clerk does not have the statutory authority and would be violating its statutory authority if it provides the money back to the defendants. And so that the and then so that's the main argument on that issue. The other um argument that the clerk raises is that the failure to join the clerk and these other entities involved in this process rendered that portion of the order regarding the refund void. Because by statutory design, again, the clerk and these other entities are involved in distributing this money, and um, by not naming. Well, to, them, to be clear, you're you're you can only argue for the clerk. Correct. Right? I mean, but, right. Yes. Right. So so and whether or not the clerk is an indispensable party is is an interesting issue. Um, whether or not Department of Revenue or any specific is also an indispensable party is, is perhaps an interesting issue. But the, the only one before us is the clerk, because you you can only speak correct. for the clerk. Okay. Correct. And that is correct. And, you know, the, in addition, speaking regarding the clerk, not only was the clerk an indispensable party, the clerk has had no notice of this proceeding or an opportunity to be heard in the proceeding. And this could have been... Uh, possibly, you know, worked out and given the clerk time to, you know, identify these other procedures on behalf of, to allow the, the um, defendant to um, obtain a refund. And so the, the, the clerk, the clerk is, the court routinely orders the clerk to take certain action, correct? Correct. 
And is it that you're just, you're just in general, you just waive any due process challenges to that, or you're usually okay with that? I mean, what what makes this particular thing different where suddenly you can say, oh, wait a minute, we can't do that. And you should have given us a chance to speak before you ordered us to do that. So for example, the, the, the clerk in the um, other expunction, expunction statute, um, 0.0585, yeah, 0 0.0585 is not ordered to do anything regarding refunds. So if the uh, court was to order something under that statute, it would have this position. The clerk has never encountered in the, you know, in my experience in this case, and I realize we're limited to the record, but I give, if you'll permit me a little leeway here, if the clerk the clerk has been, is typically ordered to do things all the time, but those are always things within their statutory authority. For example, in a criminal case, if, uh, to return a bond, right, uh, there is a statute that governs, that specifically tells the clerk where to pull that money from and to return that money, and that money is held by the clerk. That's the best example I can think of is the clerk never holds that money so that it has it to return by statutory design under the criminal bonds. In this case, there if the legislature had wanted the clerk to retain these funds in the event they might be returned one day, then it would have given the clerk the statutory authority to do so. And it has not. And so the clerk is in an untenable position here because she either, you know, does not comply with the court order to refund this money or does not co comply with her statutory duties regarding where the distribution of other money goes. And I, I presume that is why in section 939.06, there is a procedure for obtaining refunds. Um, and it's a separate commission that I presume, and I, I don't know, honestly, must have repositories of money for this purpose. And if the, there's no other questions, the, the clerk is not unsympathetic to the plight of human trafficking victims or crying poor or playing finders keepers with the defendant's funds. Here, the legislature provided these victims with a benefit by statute but the petitioner seeks a benefit beyond the plain language of that statute. And it's a benefit that the clerk is simply if without us. ask a question about this. Is okay. not the clerk of the court an independent constitutional officer? Yes, Your Honor. And the state attorney is also a constitutional officer and also governed by statute. Correct. It was it the state attorney that stipulated on behalf of the clerk? And if so, where does the state attorney's office get the authority to represent the clerk in these matters? Well, we the clerk would maintain that the state attorney does not have that authority to stipulate to um, relief that the clerk has to give. And this is why it's important for the clerk to have been given an opportunity to participate in this proceeding, because in essence, by stipulating to the order, the state attorney is speaking on behalf of the clerk's office. Okay. Um, I didn't see anything on the record that indicated the state attorney's office in this case was authorized to represent the clerk's office. Is there is correct? nothing. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I had trouble there hearing. Anything you. in the record to the contrary? There's nothing in this record, and however, this record is limited because it's only on the 1.540 motion, and we don't have access. We don't have the underlying um, record concerning the statute because we were not. Uh, party to that proceeding. And I'll save the rest of my time for rebuttal if there are no further Thank questions. You so much. Thank you. Let me clear that. Oops. Attorney Mader, the, uh, your time is going about to start, so you may start. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Dana Mader. I'm from Shinian Law Firm. I represent, through the Justice Restoration Center, their client, Ms. Santala de la Cruz, who's a survivor of human trafficking. 
Uh, first and foremost, uh, the trial court's order states that she was entitled to compensation associated with the expunged criminal history record under the case Nelson v. Colorado. The order does not state that she was entitled to this uh, refund under uh, under any statute whatsoever. So the argument here uh, is is fundamentally re uh, misplaced. The appellant, well, that, that, however, that's kind of that's kind of an interesting segue. So I mean, it, it seems that that it's kind of a concession by the court that the only authority was ordering this was under a, a case, a, a granted a, a Supreme Court of the United States case. Um, it, it raises an issue with me and a kind of a two-part issue and, and I, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on it. First is, given that this seems to be a constitutional directive um, that the court is fashioning, albeit with the stipulation of the state attorney, what, if anything, should we make of the fact that the state of Florida has not joined you in defending this appeal, has not adopted your position as its own and has not appeared? And that segues into the second part, which is that it seems to me what you all basically achieved here through the stipulation with the state attorney's office um, was a one-time, uh, one-off declaration that apparently existing procedures in Florida statutes were constitutionally inadequate um, and that Nelson nevertheless mandated um, this refund um, and that as such, um, as a matter of law, uh, Florida statutes don't pass constitutional muster. And if that's the case, then the proper vehicle for this would have been a deck action and would have been uh, to alert the state attorney's general's office so that they could be heard, so the discovery could be taken, so that the, the question that you, you all somehow got resolved through this stipulation was that existing procedures and statutes in Florida law are, in, are constitutionally inadequate. Uh, Your Honor, so as to the first question, um, yes. I can't speak as to why the state of Florida did or did not uh, file an answer brief in this matter. Um, but what I can do is tell you that the statute was followed in so much as the proper parties were, were joined. The statute specifically says which parties to join when there is a human trafficking expunction request. As far as the other statutes that were mentioned, uh, 939. Is a remedy that goes to the criminal record. It is not a financial cause of action, is my understanding, um, throughout my uh, practice time and as a, as a judge time. Expungement goes to the criminal record of arrest or conviction. There's no financial remedy here. So I didn't see anything in the statute that says anybody had to pay. So expungement seems to be, by the statute, limited to the criminal history. So in their initial brief, and we agree, this is actually a civil matter, and this is why the uh, clerk brought their motion to vacate under 1.540B. If it's and, a civil matter, why weren't the people who had the money sued directly? It's not required. It's not required by statute, but if the court looks at the legislative history, which the clerk what mentioned... You, well, what statute are you suing on? If it's the expungement racket statute, where in the statute... Does it say you have a cause of action for dollars? Well, unfortunately, Your Honor, we don't have the petition. So we don't know completely what was said, what was uh, sued, you know, what statute was sued under. All we have is the order. And on its face, it is not invalid. It does mention Nelson, but it does not mention uh, the, the statute that the clerk believes that the relief was given under. And so uh, when you look at the record, and that's all we can go by, there is no error. There is no abuse of discretion in denying the 1.540B motion. And that's what we're here not. We're not here on the final order. And the clerk has made that clear in both briefs uh, four or five times. They've mentioned that we are only here on the 1.540B motion, and they do not have standing on that motion. They did not intervene. They did not try to intervene before or after the final well, you order know, was I, entered. I, mean, I think it's sort of, that's like saying that they should have been forced to knock on the door after they've already been dragged into the courthouse. I and mean, you have yes, an order directing them to take direct action. And they're challenging that. And now you're saying, oh, they should have been asked to let into to be let into the case first. I mean, what, well, what's your best argument that a non-party who's been ordered to take affirmative action in a final order is required to first move to intervene before they can challenge that? What's your uh, yes, best your case for that? Uh, my best case for that would probably be Carlisle. Um, in that case, 
let's see, let me pull that up, please. Uh, that case says that in order to bring a 1.540B motion, someone either had to intervene, and in some cases they can intervene afterward, um, you know, in the, in the interest of justice, but they must try to intervene. And then that intervention, if denied, must be appealed as an interlocutory appeal. Now that all did has that, to did happen. Did that involve a party who was who uh, appeared for the very first time in the final order and was directed to take specific action? In Carlisle, it was a party who moved to vacate prior to the final order, but all of the cases that it relied on and all of the cases in our brief, there's not one that does not mention that a party who failed to move to intervene either before or after in the interest of justice had a, a burden. So if you do not intervene, you are a stranger to the, you're a non-party. That's, that's- Ms. Mayor, can you, identify, so, can you identify a single sure. Florida case that has ever held that an indispensable party without notice of an action was barred from seeking post-judgment relief by virtue of their failure to intervene in the case they had no notice of? Uh, Yes, Your Honor, there is a case, and I'm looking for it right now, um, where it says that if there's an interest of justice, a party who is not able to intervene prior to the order uh, can intervene afterward, and that can be granted. But that is also in the discretion of the trial court. Uh, that was in our brief. Um, that dealt with necessary parties, correct? Not indispensable parties. You, you acknowledge there's a distinction between the two concepts, correct? There is a distinction, Your Honor, and there is- The cases you've marshaled are all necessary parties. None of them are indispensable parties. I did oh, not well, read no, a actually, single case that you that you cited that dealt with an indispensable party, such that as a matter of law, the, the, the court was, was unable to proceed further with the case. I read a number of cases where there were people trying to intervene that were arguably necessary parties, but I didn't see one where there was a finding that it was an indispensable party. Well, Your Honor, I would argue that the Perlman case tell us, tells us a, that a non-party, in order to show that it's an indispensable party, must either move to, to intervene or must show the Perlman standard, right? The two-factor the two uh, factor exception to non-intervention. And that wasn't limited to a certain type of party. None of these cases were limited. None of these cases said, unless they are an indispensable party. And none of the cases then dealt with how to prove what type of party you were. The standard or the test in Perlman isn't uh, what type of party you are, but do you have the right, do you have the standing to intervene? And if you don't, then, then there's no jurisdiction. There's no jurisdiction to appeal. And the Carlisle uh, case tells us that a 1.540B motion from any type of non-party, there is not... Um, it's Counsel, Perlman, Perlman does not deal with an indispensable party because by definition, an indispensable party has standing. It is indispensable. Not only does it have standing, it has to be a part of the lawsuit or the lawsuit cannot proceed forward. It's not that, that what I'm saying is like the, those are those are those concepts necessarily have to be wedded to each other. Standing and indispensable party are, are they, they can't be divorced. So you can't be asking about whether or not a party has standing if you're talking about an indispensable party. Because of course, to be an indispensable party, you, you necessarily have to have standing. And if you are asking, or in this case, obtaining relief that requires the payment of dollars from a non-party, it seems to me that's a pretty good argument there, indispensable. I mean, I, the, the only analogous, another analogous situation that comes to mind is, you know, in a garnishment action, where um, you know a creditor gets a judgment debtor to pay them money from their account, the bank is still an indispensable party, even though the bank disclaims any interest in the account money itself. But you still have to give notice to the bank of the garnishment action. Why would this be any different? It's different because this is a ministerial action by the state, and the final order states it's granted under Nelson v. Colorado. And Nelson stands for the proposition that money taken by the state on account of a vacated conviction is the property of the accused. So now we're dealing with a due process issue. It doesn't matter and what statutory scheme. And as a general scheme. principle, that's fine. But where does Nelson say that is you're entitled to automatic refund? Where well, does Nelson, Nelson says, say that, that the state, you know, that the state cannot establish reasonable requirements to obtain a refund? Where Where is it that it gives independent jurisdiction to a court to order that refund? 
So the first quote by Justice Ginsburg says, when a conviction is invalidated, is the state obligated to refund fees, court costs, and restitution uh, from the dependent upon, and as a consequence of the conviction, our answer is yes, absent conviction of a crime, once presumed innocent. So that's a full, that's a full quote right there. That's the authority. And the authority is because it's a deprivation. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Judge Lucas, go ahead. Just real quick, but in, in the Nelson case, I, I'm trying to remember, was it the state of Colorado? I'm trying to remember. Whichever state it was, yes, um, they were a litigant. They were named party, right? So they got everything leading up to that Supreme Court decision that you're you're relying upon and that you're now quoting. They got to participate and argue and be heard. The clerk was not extended that courtesy here. The clerk is never considered. Do you, do, you, do, you see, do, you see, do you see that issue from a, I, I get that you're focusing on the due process issue of your client, and rightly so, but there's also a due process aspect that pertains to the clerk here. Well, Your Honor, right? I would, I would submit or no. to you. Is your, is your argument, no, they're not entitled to due process. Done. I mean, and if so, let me, let me hear it. Sure, absolutely. And that's not necessarily what I'm saying, but SCOTUS gave the the um, the court and the trial court relied on, on Nelson. I can't SCOTUS hear again. Gave it. Oh, no. I'll, I'll hold on. I have stopped the clock. Please stand by. IT is in route. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Judge Casanueva, can you say something so I can tell if test, 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 on? test, test, Certainly. test. Yeah. No, still, still no. trying to get a hold of her yeah Lori uh our wives down again we got yep we're holding all right She just went.
Test, 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 test. Judge Casanova, can you say something, please? Most certainly. Thank you. I heard you loud All and clear. Right. We still can't okay. hear you. Okay. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. Test one, two, test one, two. Test, 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 test. Ed, can you do one more test, please? Test, 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 test. Test, 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 test. One more time, Ted. Test, 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 <clears throat> test, test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test.
All right, I think we're good for now. Test, test. Can you hear me okay? Test, test. You can hear me? Yeah, you're fine. I can hear you. Yes, okay. loud and clear. We're good. We're good for now. I apologize. I lost track of the time. Can your honors let me know where I am? I absolutely can. I actually remember <laughs> hit the stop button. You are at 929. Thank you so much, Your Honor. So for once, I uh, managed the clock perfectly <laughs> with the right information. Despite all the technological failures, my skill set can handle a little clock. <laughs> well, mine can't, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I now, just let's see. Do we have everybody on board? Yes. I'm waiting for Judge Rothstein Yoakum. Oh, there she is. I see you. Okay, then you may resume. Thank you, Your Honor. And um, just so we circle back, um, it is not our contention to agree that the clerk is an indispensable party. Um, in the initial brief, the clerk um, stated that at a minimum, it would be the clerk, the Florida Department of Revenue, the Executive Office of the Florida Governor, and the Florida Clerk of Court Operations Corporation. These are the exact type of constraints that Nelson sought to get rid of in any state statutory scheme. Nelson says there should not be anything at the bare minimum, a, a, a tiny little ministerial um, action maybe for uh, a well, survivor I, I thought, of human I trafficking. Nelson, I thought Nelson sought to get rid of the requirement that you prove actual innocence, not necessarily uh, that you get rid of any sort of statutory scheme for recovery, you know, completely. Not completely, but anything more than a small ministerial action or a small um, action that they must take by filing a form or filling out a form, which certainly Miss uh, Santalo de la Cruz did here, uh, would but, be. But she did, she did to get expunction under that chapter, which which is a very narrow statutory remedy that doesn't provide for money back. So it seems that nor, nor just filing not, that the single form for expunction doesn't doesn't get you the recovery that you're looking for. Yes, and your honor did mention um, the compensation statute 961.06. I would submit to you that none of our expunction statutes uh, uh, mention that or, or mention compensation or even mention a uh, ceiling of records. Uh, none of them do because those do exist in sister statutes, uh, but they're just uh, contemplated. In fact, the clerk didn't have any issue with the order to seal the records. That's not listed in the statute either. But the ministerial acts of the clerk are presumed to be done when the expunction occurs. That's what Nelson intended. And Nelson, um, it, it's interesting because Justice Alito, although he concurred, he disagreed with the method on how they got there to, to saying that anything more than this, this small um, uh, ministerial action would be a violation of a human trafficking survivor's due process rights. Um, and there were two cases, there were the Matthews case and the Medina case. And under both, Matthews was civil and Medina was criminal and Ginsburg went uh, civil and, and Alito went criminal. And both of them determined that it would be uh, against somebody's due process rights. It would be uh, the state or the, you know, keeping somebody's property that's that's rightfully theirs. Should there be anything more? And it, it the, seems the to me you're 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 in a little bit of a bind though. If you're because you're spending a, a good deal of time talking about Nelson and and the constitutional mandate that it that it lays out, and and I can understand why. Um, but at the same time, you're saying we're not really talking about that order at all. We're talking about the the 1.540 order, the, the post-judgment order. But your argument necessarily depends upon Nelson basically carrying you past how this, how this went down procedurally. So I, I don't think the two are, are really as, as distinguished as, as maybe you're, you're suggesting. I, I think you're, you're, you're relying on Nelson. Correct. To, to so as, as you're as you're to to affirm the order before us, your argument is, hey, Nelson mandates this. Full stop. There's no more, you know, there's no more, no more process. There's no more stuff that you got to jump through unless it's just, you know, a tiny little ministerial thing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing your words. But <laughs> your argument today is affirm C. Nelson. 
Well, Your Honor, I think that's a, a little misplaced only because we're not dealing with that order. We're dealing with the 1.540B motion. That's the only. That's but the you only keep coming back to challenged. Nelson. All of your well, arguments keep coming back to Nelson, which was the basis of the original order. That And yeah. listen, your position may be right. I mean, there may be a constitutional infirmity here that the legislature needs to fix or the court. But if that's the case, then I go back to what my first question was, which is, why was this brought as a deck action? Yes, Your Honor. Like, hey, Florida, Florida statutes don't pass muster. They are not constitutional. And as applied to my client who just had her just had her uh, criminal record expunged, uh, she is entitled to immediate recompensation. And there's no there's no means for her to get that. Yes, Your Honor. And certainly that's something that we can bring up with uh, the Justice Center. Um, should should Your Honors believe that Nelson isn't enough, but I don't think we get there. The reason I am focused on Nelson is to, to indicate to the court that, that even if you do get to this argument, even if you do say they're an indispensable party, they should have been there because this statute, so their whole reason for saying they're an indispensable party is because of the statute. We are saying that they're not an indispensable party because it's not the statute under which this relief was granted. So I don't understand their argument. Them, I don't understand their argument to be phrased that way. I understand their argument to be we are an indispensable party because you're ordering us to do something that no statute gives us, not the statute, just no statute gives us the authority to do, and that we don't have that money set aside. You're at you're ordering us to pay money that we can't do, that we don't have. Paying no, money honor, ordinarily statute. makes folks indispensable parties. Ordinarily. Well, Your Honor, the statute that um, Judge Ross and you can mentioned earlier, 939.06, um, or excuse me, sorry, that's the one, uh, 961.06, my apologies, uh, does indicate that the clerk needs to return funds for expungement. So there are statutes out there uh, that do directly deal with that. And, no, and so I disagree. Wait, uh, wait, wait 961.02, I believe, the, uh, chapter 961, because actually it goes through a, a bunch of different sections. The money doesn't come from the clerk. The application is not filed by the clerk. The application is filed with uh, the Department of Legal Affairs, and the refund is made by I think the the like the financial office out of the general revenue fund. That is not a direct action against the clerk. So, so to that, what you just said is is not correct. Well, Your Honor. Um there are statutes that do exist that offer compensation is is was my point but to that i would say that directly um, from the clerk so so the clerk this ministerial right um um action right this return of funds is um maybe not in that statute specifically um hold on just one moment please uh, apart from overpayment or a release of bond where is the clerk, what statute authorizes the clerk to directly hand over a check or money to somebody? Well, when there's a deprivation of, right. I, I understand what your honor is asking and that wasn't um, necessary con necessarily contemplated in this order. This order only mentions relief under Nelson. And let's see, the, um, and in Nelson, the court held that the governmental interest at stake is zero. That's at 12.55. They said the rest I, of the money is I don't think the clerk is disputing that she gets her money back mm -hmm. upon the, the effective vacator of her conviction. I don't think that's in dispute. I think the dispute is this is not the proper mechanism to do it. So I don't think the general holding of Nelson is, a, is, a, is at all in question here. The only question is, what's the proper procedure? And so does a trial court have independent jurisdiction somewhere, because it's not statutory, where does it get its authority to direct the clerk to hand over the money absent any statutory scheme for it to do so? And Your Honor, I would submit to you that just like all of its other ministerial tasks, because I know I keep going back to that, but you know, this order also asked for expunction, or uh, excuse me, uh, stealing of records, of uh, delivering records to another, uh, to, to the uh, sheriff, and, and multiple other ministerial actions by the clerk. And just because this happens to deal with the property 
of, of Ms. Santola de la Cruz, it's no different from the other actions that the clerk must do upon an expunction. And it, it's a fundamental right. It's, it's not in question. Alito said it, Ginsburg said it, everyone has said that this property does not belong to the state and it must come back. Now, whether Florida needs to create a statutory scheme for that or or not, whether or not Nelson's not enough, that's that's not in the in Nelson. Nelson doesn't say so each state must create a statute that deals with Nelson. Nelson says carte blanche, you have the right to get your money back. Now um but where does Florida it say you have the right to have the court that to have the clerk give it to you right away? It doesn't say right away and it doesn't say the clerk nor does it not it also it mean. also doesn't mention from whom you get that money right because that's really no, the doesn't. issue here Re really the issue here is you all ran a stipulation through pretty quick and pretty easy presumably through a through the assigned through the assigned criminal division you got a stipulation yay um good that's good work um uh, but the problem was the way you did it isn't a way that that seems to be to be contemplated a, a lawful mechanism of, of obtaining this refund. It's kind of like if, you know, it's, it's all well and good in, in a different civil context. It's all well and good if a plaintiff and a defendant agrees, hey, this non-party is the one that owes uh, the plaintiff money. Let's have, let's just have an order that says that non-party is responsible to pay it. I mean, great, they can agree to it, but if that non-party is not there, that order is void. And Your Honor, I would submit that's only if they're an indispensable party, and we do not contend that they are. But any financial I, I know difficulty... you're arguing that they're not. I'm just having, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm scratching my head as to how they can't be an indispensable party if the order says, pay the, my client money. And every single other order that it gives instruction to the clerk, and including this one and all the other instructions in it, have not been challenged, and I, I right because because that's because that's part all of that stuff is within the statutory purview and authorization that the clerk has, but they don't have the authority to just refund money to folks based upon stipulations to which they've never been heard. I think that's the problem you've got here is the way you all chose to tee this up. Well, we would submit to you that any financial difficulties by the clerk cannot be transferred to the backs of these human trafficking victims. Nelson says it, and hey, listen, trial court I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm not saying human trafficking victims that have had their records expunged should be made to shoulder any financial burdens. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just what I'm suggesting is that the way you did this doesn't seem to jive with due process. And that's another but issue. Should the court, but should the court follow the clerk's reasoning then, there would be so many indispensable parties, so much going on in the trial level that then the due process rights would be violated under Nelson. It can't occur. Nelson has to be the justification for a return of property that's being unlawfully withheld from an innocent person. And what, what point, you're arguing, innocent. what you're arguing is the kind of thing I would expect to hear in a deck action after we there's been some discovery and after the attorney general has gotten to put some argument and you make some some compelling arguments that if I were a trial judge presiding over that deck action that hey the existing statutory framework is doesn't pass muster it doesn't under Justice Ginsburg's view under Justice Alito's view I mean Justice Ginsburg's the only one that matters because she wrote the majority but. Under any view, it doesn't pass constitutional muster, and therefore, what we've got in place is not enough. Compelling arguments, right? I mean, that that could could be, um, but it just doesn't seem like you can you can make those and have them stick to to use a colloquialism through a stipulation in a criminal division when that was never teed up and nobody got notice of this outside of the state attorney and defense counsel. I understand that, Your Honor, and I do think that if you do reverse, you uh, would would be able to reverse from the 1.540B if you do assume that they are an indispensable party, or do hold, excuse me, that they're an indispensable party, and at that point, then the, the trial court would have the option to, to support that decision with something other than Nelson, but here we cannot have a reversal of this order because this order is not up on appeal. The only order up on appeal is the 1.540B and the only right. way that gets reversed is if this is an indispensable party. And uh, I think so I'm out of time. time. <laughs> if there are no further questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Is someone... No, I was going to let you know, let the argument go because it was yes. interrupted and I wanted to make sure that you got a chance to fully develop it. But we're at 23 now. So you are... Yes, Your Honor. 
I will conclude. You are actually right on point. <laughs> well, I thank this court and the panel uh, for your time and respectfully request the appeal is uh, dismissed or, or affirmed. Okay. We'll return to the appellant who still has her five minutes remaining, Attorney Fiore. Thank you, <clears throat> Your Honor. Um, very simply, there is no ministerial function for the clerk to pay a refund in this case. There are other statutes that govern that. The only ministerial action of the clerk under the statute here is to expunge the record. And the reason the, court, the clerk did not challenge those particular directives, expunging the record or ordering it sealed or sealing it is because those fall well within the statutory authority and within the clerk's court-related functions set out in 28.353A and B. The clerk so the is problem not, here is not that the court ordered you as a non-party to do something. The problem is that the court ordered you to do that thing in particular. Correct. Correct, because the the clerk, as you you know, as you know, but bears repeating, is a constitutional officer that has very strict duties under statute, and has no authority to do the thing that it's been ordered to do. The other things fall within the clerk's duties, and so the clerk is not a party by statutory design to this statute because the statute doesn't order or doesn't authorize a refund. The state cannot speak for the clerk without due process, the clerk has been ordered to pay a remedy that is simply not contemplated by the statute. And if you look at the other statutes that have been discussed, the 961, the 939.06, those do not reference the clerk. Those are other entities that may or may not, we don't know, have the funds available to provide these refunds. Um, basically, uh, we, you know, we're not, again, it bears repeating, we are not, um, claiming that making this argument due to financial difficulties of the clerk's office or because we are unsympathetic, the clerk is unsympathetic to human trafficking victims. It's very simple that here the clerk does not have cut statutory authority to do this as the trial court did not have the authority to order it or the state have the authority to stipulate to it. Clerk does not have the custody of the funds to refund, the discretion to have retained them, or the jurisdiction to retrieve them. And if there are no further questions, we ask that you reverse the summary denial of the 1.540B4 motion and remand with instructions to vacate only that portion of the order regarding the refund. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Thank you, Huff Council, for bearing with us today. On behalf of the court, I apologize for the interruptions that we had. Hopefully, we'll figure out what is transpiring within the uh, many technologies and resolve it soon. We hope to see you again live and in person, as they say, and uh, please stay well. Thank we'll you. let you transition you. out. Um,